to adapt, don't we? We have to be an adaptable people here in these last days. You know, if we don't have piano player, we just we sing praises anyway, isn't that right? Uh -huh. You know, it's not oh we have the best voice and all we sound. It's the heart that God's yeah. looking at Amen. today, right? He said, "Make a joyful noise mm -hmm. unto the Lord." You know, it's talking about singing with the Spirit and singing with understanding. So the Spirit of the living God inside, right, sings a joyful noise to our Creator and our Redeemer. We're going to be on part number two. Part number two: True greatness consists in true godliness. True greatness consists in what? True, true godliness. As always, I uh, ask if you could, if it's possible, that you deal with me and I pray one more time for the Holy Spirit to take possession. Our kind, loving Heavenly Father, we thank You for the privilege of prayer. We pray now for the Holy Spirit to consume each and every one of Your children here this morning. Lord, we came because we desire to be in Your presence. We desire to hear from heaven. We desire to be encouraged and strengthened. And Lord, we desire to be corrected where we need to be corrected. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, your long suffering. Thank you for your precious life that you willingly gave in our behalf. Now, Lord, again, I ask that you forgive me of any sin, anything in my heart and life that needs not be there. Lord, my mind needs to be open. I need to hear your voice. Your children need to hear your voice today. We need to be encouraged. And we need to say, Lord, this is the way. Walk ye in it. Thank you for hearing. Thank you for answering prayer. Thank you for the privilege now to be able to open your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I can't tell you how thankful I am for the word of God. I can't tell you how grateful and thankful I am. I hear so many voices on all sides. Yes. You know, we need, to walk, we need to walk this way. We need to go here. We need to go there. But, you know, I always am drawn back to Scripture mm -hmm. because it tells me. The Bible says that God's going to guide my steps, right? Every step, He's going to guide it if I'm willing to be guided. Right. And so I'm thankful for that. I can go back and, and the, the, the balance that we need in Scripture, and God will tell me exactly how I need to conduct my life to be a witness for Him. We realize today that it means so much when you say, I am a child of God. When you say, I'm a Christian, what does that really, really mean? You think about it in your own life. What does that really mean? You say, I'm a Christian. I, well, I've been a Christian all of my life. Oh, that means you've been Christ-like all of your life then, huh? Is that, what, is that what it means? I'm a Christian. That means Christ-like. But yet, think of our conduct sometimes. Think of our choices. Think of some of the... Say we, we made decisions that have not been like Christ. That's right. And then how we need to get it together here in these last moments of earth's history. True greatness. The world I hear all the time. I, I, I'm going to be very honest with you. I, get, I'm, I'm, I, I used to love you know, a lot of sports and a lot of things in you know, years past and things that go on. And We always hear how great somebody is. You ever hear, you know, they're a great athlete. You know, they're a great this. They're a great that. True greatness, the Bible talks about, consists in godliness. And most of that has nothing to do with God. Yeah. Right. Amen. In fact, I wonder so much when I, and people think it's okay but many times when they, you know, before a boxing match, before they beat somebody's head, and somebody's not with me. I'm with you. Come on. You know, they say a little prayer. Oh, my. So we believe that God's in it. You know, for a football game sometime before they go try to tear their fellow man's head off, if somebody's still with me. Yeah. They have prayer and ask for God to be with them, I guess, to give them strength to hurt the other guy. I'm just saying here, we need to really think because sometimes what we think is godliness is not godliness right. at all. Yeah. It's the counterfeit that the uh -huh. devil has. What is we're talking about? True godliness. Now, what we covered the first part. If you missed the first part, you you missed the foundation of, of the subject that we're talking about. And I've always felt impressed that it's not really fair for people who come in for the second part. They really don't understand when you begin in the middle of something. And so I like to go over about eight little parts that we covered and just put them in your memory bank, if you will. What we learned last time in Titus two eleven through fifteen. We use that Titus two eleven through fifteen. Here's the bottom line on that. You can read it, jot it down when you have time. It says simply, we need to live what? Soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Right. Now, a lot more to it, so you take time to read it. But remember, we're to live how? Soberly. Come on, somebody. I can read it. Somebody still don't get it. We're to live soberly and righteously. That means in our right mind. Did you get it? Righteously and godly in this present world. And you know what? That is a challenge. That's right. To live for God in this world that the enemy has had almost complete control over. 
Is that a fair statement? Yes. The enemy is running rampant inside and outside the church. There's no doubt about it. And so as we think about this, to live soberly and righteously, do the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. To live a godly life in this present world, we need outside help from the Holy oh, Spirit. Oh, yes. Amen. We learn, too, that true success is not the result of chance. It's not the result of accident. It's not... That, 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 you know, that all is a result of some kind of the people say, Well, that's my destiny. It's the outworking of God's providence. The outworking, what? Well, true success is the outworking of God's providence in my life because God opens doors, He shuts doors, He gives us opportunities and privileges. Think about that. And here's another point that we said God gives opportunities. Do we believe that? Yes. yes. Now, what's success? Su success depends upon our right use of that opportunity. Mm. God gives opportunity to every one of us every day to do something for Him. Yes. Every day He gives grand opportunities. Now, what we do with that right. determines whether it's successful or not yes. in the eyes of God. We also learn that God uses those who are faithful, listen, in the smallest things of life. And if we do, do that, he will make us faithful in those, that which is larger, bigger, more responsibility. So it's, it's a, a, a necessity that we are faithful in what? In the least. Remember, is that what he says in the Bible? If you're faithful in the least, I'll make you faithful in what? In much. You know, you can't say, well, I, I want much and I want the big things. I want to be involved in the big things here. God says, I challenge you with the least. And if you are faithful in the least, I've often said, I said last time, you know, 3ABN and different things starting years and years ago and still yet today, if the stool stops up, they call Pastor Kennedy to stop the stool. Yes. That's all right. It's okay. I have to be faithful in those things as well as everybody else. Yes. Right. And I've often said, if, if there's a ditch to be dug, I'll have my shovel and I'll be down there with you and I'll be encouraging you to come down with me to help. Yes. Is that all right? Yes. Those are things that need to be done that we call the least. Some people don't want to be involved unless their name is in lights and they get all the attention. Are you still with me? We learned also that who's going to be able to stand in these last days? Who's yes. going to be able to stand? Who is it? Psalms 24 told us, verses 3 and 4, it says, Him that he that has what? Clean, clean hands and, and a pure heart. Kind of, and a pure heart. Amen. Only those with clean hands. I mean, that sin's gone out of the life. Did you get it? Yes. Clean hands. Nothing you have to answer for, right? Hands that you can lift as it were to God, you know, in prayer. Nothing on those hands. And those who have a pure heart. In other words, your motives are what? Pure. Your motives are pure. You're not doing it because somebody's looking. Somebody's going to take note of it. You're not willing to... You, know, you don't have to worry about what the right... Don't let the right hand know what the left hand's doing. How many times have you read that? We don't need to be saying, I'm fasting and I'm praying. Nothing wrong with that. You know, we, we need to fast. We need to pray. We don't need to go around telling everybody about it. Right? It's between us and God that we're doing these things for His honor and His glory. We realize also, we learned that wrongs must be called wrongs. Did you yes. get it? Amen. Grievous sins must be called by their right name and by the grace of God put away. Very simple, isn't it? Here in these last days. So wrong has to be called wrong, right? Yes. Sin is called sin. Mm -hmm. The axe right. must be laid to the what? Right. To the root of it. Uh, I read something about here. Somebody can tell if I'm wrong, if I remember possibly or not, about the banana, banana tree. They said they, a banana tree can go through fires and storms and anything. that You can chop it in every different direction, but it will always grow back until you take it out by the roots. Hmm. Some the banana tree, the whole thing has been just burnt down. You think there's nothing left but a little nub of banana, it'll grow right back. Well, the only way you can kill that banana tree is to get it by the roots. Sin has to be the right way. Is that what we're talking about here? Yes. You've got to lay the axe to the root of the thing and get down to the nitty-gritty. Put it away by God's grace. We learn that there are conditions to success. Yes. Now remember, I'm not talking about success. I've never thought about success in this world. To me, there's not a success in this world. As a Christian, we need to be a worker for Jesus. One that heaven approves of. I understand that. But too many people are worried about success in this world. Have we attained? Are we making so much money? Do we have such a kind of house? we drive such and such a kind of, of a car? But conditions to success are always, always the same. Number one is we have to toil. We have to work a lot. Yes. Somebody yes. still with me? Yes, that's yes. true. Two, we have to endure mm -hmm. for a while. And number three, we have to believe. Yeah. Amen. You see what I'm saying? This is somebody wrote that out, thought very interesting is. So we work a while, endure a while, believe a while, right? Pray a while. These are all things to be successful as heaven views it. We must not be indifferent to, to the things that are going on in the church. 
that are apparent wrongs, they need to be corrected because we do have a corporate responsibility. Yeah. That means an overall responsibility mm -hmm. of sin that is in the church. God holds the church what? Accountable. Accountable for those things that are known. And if we do not take care of those things, then we, what, it's put to our account. Yeah. And I just tell you, I can't, I, I don't want any of your stuff. No. Uh -uh. Somebody's not with me. We're like, oh, you get it? You don't want any of my stuff. You right. see what I'm saying, right? I can't afford to have your sin on me and vice versa, right? Right. right. So you, you know what I'm taking. They have to be dealt with. President Lincoln said this one time. He said, I do the very best I know how to do. Pretty good advice, wouldn't you say? Yeah. I do the very best I know how to do. You realize what a challenge that would be to us as Christians today who have so much knowledge that God yes. has given of Scripture yes. and all the help that we have today. Yes. Are we doing the very best yes. we know how to do? We should be. We should be. Oh, it's all. Oh, it's easy to say, oh, yes, I am. But no, I'm talking about get serious with yourself. I don't need to hear a yes from you. You don't need to hear a yes. It's easy to say, yes, I am. But are we really doing the very best that I know how to do by the grace of God? We're talking about the knowledge that we have to live up to. I hear people say we, we, need, more, we need more instructions in the Word of God. We need more you know, the Holy Spirit. We need more prophets in the last days because, you know, you know we need to go back to the Word right here. Isn't that right? Learn to do what God has already revealed to us. Right. As God, right. you know, as He reveals it, He gives us strength to accomplish it. Mm -hmm. So Abraham Lincoln, he didn't stop there. I do the very best I know how. And the very best I can. Well. Interesting. And I do the very best I can. Mm -hmm. And then I like the last part he said. You can apply the spiritual. I hope that you do. All the other doesn't mean, doesn't mean anything. And he looked at the person and he said, And I mean to keep doing so. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. What a stance. By the grace of God, I mean to continue to do well. that which God has revealed to me. Yeah. Should we have that kind of a stance as a Christian? Yes. Yes. We should always have that. There was a man that was asked the secret of success. And I think this is important. Put this, put this in our, our, our memory bank. He was a successful businessman. And every time you find somebody in the world, I don't know if you know it, somebody successful in the world, all of a sudden like, oh man, they must have brains. Mm -hmm. You know, they must have insight. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we want to find out what's going on this morning. Because if they're success, that's what I want to be, so I, I want to know how he, how he does. You know, a lot of people in the world, they say, man, these people are successful. They've got a lot of money. They probably, a lot of them didn't do a thing for it. They inherited it from mom and daddy. And, yeah. and they inherited it from mom and daddy. You know what I'm talking about. And I always find this sometimes because people have a lot of money over here. All of a sudden, they're asked to sit on boards and do a lot of things. When they didn't have money, they weren't asked to sit on it. Well, mm -hmm. So I'm not sure money doesn't make you have brain. But okay. Easy. Success, I need to be careful. <laughs> You've got to follow the thinking along here. The successful man was asked the secret of his accomplishments. What would, how, his reply was simple. He said, good judgment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. What's, the, what's, the, what's the secret to your success? He said, good judgment. Yes. Said, well, that makes sense to me. And then somebody else out there said, well, yeah, yeah, well okay, yeah, I, I get that. But, 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 well, where did you learn good judgment? Mm -hmm. Are you still with me? Yes. Where did you learn good judgment? See, they wanted to know because they wanted to be a success. So where did you learn this good judgment? And you know what he said? He said, from experience. From experience. And, of course, you have somebody else out there that wasn't, like for me, it wouldn't be enough. I'd have to say something like, well, where did you gain your experience? <laughs> And here's what he said. I gained my experience from poor judgment. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's true. Amen. Some of our worst failures yeah. as end results have been our greatest blessing. Yeah. Because we learn mm -hmm. from those things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they became our greatest victory. Yeah. You see? Mm -hmm. We use poor judgment sometimes. Yes. Yeah. But boy, when we learn a lesson from it. And this is God's teaching us these Amen. things, right? Yes. He wants us to have good judgment. True greatness consists of accepting the work that God has given you to do and given me to do. I've often thought about 2 Timothy 2 verse 5. Just something to contemplate because you've read it so, so often. 
Oh, so often. And because we're talking about success and we're talking about godliness, the Bible warns that there is a form of what? Godliness. Good. 2 Timothy 2, 5. And he said because there's a form of godliness, but we're denying something. The power. Right? The power of what? The power of God. So there's a form of godliness going on in the world today. There's a lot of forms going on in the world. But remember, true greatness consists in being true to God. Yes. But now we have, the Bible says, a form of what? Godliness. Of godliness. I thought, how interesting. And you look up that word in the original language, it says this religion, as it were, or this godliness, has the appearance of being good. See, the outside of it, this, this, is, this, is, this is good. The world today believes because outside these walls it says church, that it must be alright. Have you ever, ever? The preacher said so. The evangelist said so. What does the Word of God say? Right. And certainly they're to direct, direct us back to the Word of God. Whatever anybody says, it's up front, right? Up front. Mm -hmm. Because the church said outside, it says church. Or come in for good services doesn't mean you'll get the right service. Mm -hmm. There are forms of godliness. The Bible said, be careful about this form. It has a semblance yes. of godliness. It looks it. It seems like it is. And one word I thought was very interesting uh, when it says a form of godliness, it says it has a formula. Well, yes. You see, in this life we always look for formulas. You put the right, somebody with me here? Yes. You put the right things together in order to create something that is maybe good. A little, a little of this, a little that. Mama used to cook that way. Did anybody cook that way? Huh? Yeah. And they'd always say a little dab of this and a handful of that or just a twinge of this or a pinch. I always heard a pinch. Mama said, well, I put, put a pinch. What, what's, a, what's a pinch to you? What's a pinch to me? It could be different. I think like to measure. But see, a, a formula. So there's churches, as it were, or people, right? We're not saying who, what, trying to condemn anybody. But the Bible gives a warning about this. There's a, many in the world that has a formula. In other words, they're going through the going to church every week, taking up tithes and offering and singing songs and going through all the formula, the motions for it. Yes. But now, what is it, what is, what is, what is it going to be for the, the outcome of this thing? Mm. Those of you who make bread, you realize you need to put the right stuff in there. You don't get it. Yes, that's right. We've often talked about that. You know, I, I tried it one time in my mind. I took a power saw and basically saw that piece of bread. Didn't it? I thought you could heat it up for a while and, and then, oh, I had to leave and go somewhere, just turn the oven off, come back and resume. Some of you don't get that. I mean, some of you haven't been making bread. I get to making some bread. Right? Well, that's good for you. Now, hey. I actually thought you could turn the thing off and just let it go. It was halfway coming up. It was rising up, you know, about this high, but it hadn't come all the way up. I had somebody call. I had to go somewhere. I just turned the oven off. So I'll come back. I'll fire it back up. It's going to be Got that thing out. You could do it like a brick. <laughs> okay, so we learn, right? We, we can learn. It has a formula. Godliness, it seems like it. But here's what we're denying. The Bible said, you know, we're talking about success here, but a successful church has power in it. Yes. Is that true? Yes. What is that power? Well, certainly it's the elder or the preacher or... No, the right? Holy Spirit. No, no. Holy Spirit. the power of what? Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Power here in the Greek simply means it's talking about... It's strength it's talking about here. Also, it's, it's talking about miracle working power. Amen. So in the church, there must be the Holy Spirit or miracle working power that what? That changes hearts and attitudes and desires and, and, and can shape the tongue the way it needs to be and the brain the way it needs to be and the... And what? Ears. <laughs> the ears. Everything. The hands. Everything to, to hear and to see and to do. How wonderful that is. Think about it. Uh, I thought very interesting because people talk about, you know, gifts and so on and so forth. But I know this. Second Peter talks about I need to make my calling and what? Election sure. Election sure. sure. Is that possible? Yes. yes. You can make your calling and election sure as you make a total commitment to Jesus Christ. Think about it. Why? Because the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1 9, he that is called called you is holy. Amen. The one that's called you is holy. The one that Amen. called you has made no mistake Amen. when he called you into his service. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Mm. The Bible said that he the one that's called you, he's he's faithful. The one who's called you, he is faithful. 2 Timothy or 1 Thessalonians 5 24. I thought I've often thought about the different gifts in the church to be a successful church. 
Everybody thinks they have to have the same gift. That's not true. It's all different gifts, isn't that right? In the church, 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says, there are diversities of what? Gifts. Of gifts. Uh -huh. Everybody has different Every gifts gift. in the That's church, right. but they're to work together for the edifying or the building up uh, of the church, not the tearing apart. Think about it. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says it's going to be, the Holy Spirit will divide these gifts yes. and give severally as He will. Yes. Do you think everybody has a gift? At least one? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. You know what? Time and time again, if you ask, if you ask people, do you, what gift has God given you? They have no idea. Mm -hmm. They say, I don't have any. Well, you just call God a liar. Well, and no one wants to do that, you see. Yeah. Because everybody has at least one gift. One talent the Bible talks about, isn't that right? So we can take that one, we can bury it, or we can take it and invest it, and then what? We can give back to the cause of Christ. The more that you use that gift and talent you have, the more that will increase, yes. right? The more that responsibility God will allow you to have in the cause of Christ. True greatness then consists of accepting the work that God has given you to do. Please don't look at me and say, well, I, I need to do that kind of work. I need to look. Everybody has different gifts. That's right. Find out where you fit. Whether it's hospitality, whether it's I'm, I'm just going to work and do something around the church, or I'm going to do something in the ministry, I'm going to pass out literature, I'm going to give Bible studies, you know, I'm going to work in the health work, I'm going to do whatever it might be in the cause of Christ. Because you realize that one person can't do it all. That's right. Three or four people can't do it. There's room at the cross for you. There's room for you to fit in. But yet, I find many times there's jealousy in the church. Yes. There's jealousy in the movement. Brothers, you realize there's plenty of room. You can grow as big right, and faithful as you want to be under the power of God. Think about those things. Mm -hmm. There's room for you. There's room for expansion. There's room for growth. And I'll say that, and God requires that of you. Amen. He yes. requires it because He's going to count you and me an unfaithful steward, mm -hmm. as it were, of that gift if we don't multiply it. Mm -hmm. See? If we don't use what God has given us, we're going to be held accountable for that. That's right. I think we can go along with these words that were penned many years ago, and especially in Scripture. Remember where God said, I'll never leave you, and I'll never what? Mm -hmm. You know, Matthew th or Hebrews 13, 5. I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Isn't that right? I'm with you, Matthew 28. I'm with you always, 18. I'm with you always to the end of the world. Yeah. Right. So we can count on these things. And I remember when God's servant penned some words said, When in my youth I accepted the work given me by God. How many of us have accepted the work that God has given to us? How many of us really have accepted it as, as, as such an honor and a privilege that God would look at you or look at me and say, Will you do this for me? Yes. Will you represent me? Mm -hmm. Will you go and do this for me? Well, we always look, Well, ooh, I'd have to give this up. I, well, I can't have this and do this over here. I, are we, are we weighing those things out or are we saying, Lord, here am I? Mm -hmm. Right? Send, send me. This is what I, I, Lord, I want to work for you. I want to do something for you. There'll be no people that are not wanting to work in the kingdom for God. There'll be workers that will be in the kingdom. Does that make sense to yes. us? We'll be workers in the cause of Christ. We must be. Faith without works. Oh, yeah. Accepted the work given me by God and, and, and that work was received with a promise. From aid from the mighty helper. Has the Holy Spirit promised you aid? To be yes. successful in the cause of God? Yes. Promised you help? Absolutely have. Yes. It says, I give you a solemn charge to deliver faithfully the Lord's message. And making no difference from friend or foe. How often in our message and our approach sometimes we make a difference between, as it were, people we know and people we don't know. Mm -hmm. We should never do that because my Bible tells me that God is what? No respecter of Acts chapter 10, right. 34. God's no respecter of persons. And when we're dealing with different people, you know, regardless of their education, their background, or whatever it might be, we must deliver faithfully the word that God has given to us. Sacred trust. I wonder how many of us are willing to do that. The Bible said if you put your trust in the Lord, right? He was going to keep you safe. Read that Proverbs 29, 25. I believe this. In this life of the true Christian, you consider yourself today a true Christian, a true, true child of God. There are no, listen to the word, there are no non-essentials. Mm -hmm. In the Christian life, there are no what? Non-essentials. Non well, that, that's not important. It doesn't matter. In the sight of God, every duty is important. Mm -hmm. right. Every duty. You might say, well, every week all I do is take the, the pots and pans from fellowship lunch and take them in the kitchen. Do what? Be faithful. 
-hmm. Somebody needs to do it. Right. If you don't do it, there'll be somebody else that'll have to do it. And usually it's the busiest people, if you know what I'm talking about. Come on. Be faithful in those things. God has challenged us with that. The Lord says every gift, He measures every gift, every capability that He has given. Who measures it? God. The Lord. God measures every gift and every ability that He's given to us. And we're going to be judged mm -hmm. by how we carry yes. it out. Yes. Oh, we're, have we been faithful? Huh. Did we use the gifts properly? Or the powers that God has given to glorify Him? I read one time in Scripture in 1 Timothy 4, 14. And we move quickly so people jot them down. They can read them later. But it says, neglect not the gift that is within thee. Right. Neglect what? Not Don't the neglect the gift that is within thee. Hmm. Because everything He gives us, remember, every gift He gives us is to bring what? Glory, glory to yes. Him. You remember the three angels' message? Give glory to God. Right, to God, right? We're in the hour of God's judgment. Yes. Give glory. You say, well, I don't know how to give glory. In one simple of the way Psalms 50 uh, talks about it, verse 23, it says, Whosoever offereth praise glorifieth God. Mm. Does that make sense? Amen. Whoever what? Offered. Whoever offereth praise glorifieth God. Because when you're praising God, you're telling what He has done in your heart Amen. and in your life. Yes. A miracle that took place. A yes. transformation Amen. that took place by the mm -hmm. divine power that lives inside of you. And so you bring honor and glory to Him through your praises. Thank you, Jesus. Friend, I'm telling you, we need to be thinking about that consistently. And that really simply means that, you know, we talk about uh, praise. That's adoration. That's thanksgiving, right, as we come before Him. Hmm. And I, I looked up the words, kind of interesting, and some of it will go over your head. Not because you can't comprehend, but because you won't want to. You'd like to hear it, though, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Talk about whoever uh, offers praise to God, glorify Him. It says, anyone who, who puts an extension on their hands. I'll leave it at that. Some of you can't get it. Whoever extends their hands. God would have yeah. to. Yeah. It happens to praise. That's an interesting word. I didn't make it up. You just look it up and study it for yourself here. And I know it can be overdone, but that's kind of an interesting thought here. Because usually when we're excited about something, first thing we do is, woo, praise the Lord. You know, <laughs> praise the Lord. True greatness consists in what? Quickly, true godliness. I talked about last week, if a person is a businessman here, businessman, he needs to pay special attention to this. And my heart goes back to Daniel. Do you remember Daniel? Mm -hmm. He was taken into captivity, wasn't he? Yes. You remember? Right? Mm -hmm. By Nebuchadnezzar. So he's actually a prisoner, right? He was actually a slave. He was brought in. Because he was a success, as God views success, God put him in high position there. Well, in fact, he was a statesman. Do you remember? Man, that's a high position. Read that in Daniel 2, 44 through 48 and 49. So he was a statesman in the, king of, uh, in the kingdom of Babylon. And also, not only Babylon, but what? It to meet a Persian, to follow him, because he was so faithful there. Also, even when they went down, he was also right. Still lifted up. God still lifted him up. To me, that tells a lot about a, a businessman or somebody that's in, in, in business. A working man. Daniel was a working man. Daniel was times he was a policy man. There was, he was a planning man. He was a building man. He was in everything that went on because of his position. Now think about it. But even though he was he called a businessman, and for those who are in business today, like Daniel, you may become a man after God's own heart. Mm, yes. You may become a man that God will instruct step by step. Amen. Why? Daniel, a prime minister of the greatest earthly kingdom that existed then, he was also, listen, at the same time, a prophet of God. Of God. Yes. So you, you could be in high position in this world. Things that are going on in the world. But you still be true to who? God. To God. And if you're true to God, He's going to be true to you. Yes. He's going to bless you. He's going yes. to encourage you step by step. And proof of that is when, remember, the enemies, as it were, what did the enemies do? You remember what the enemies did? They tried to kill him, but they wanted to say, let's kind of go over the books and see what kind of his business transactions. Let's see if he was faithful. And when they went over, they scrutinized everything that Daniel did. Huh. And it was found without any kind of a flaw. 
Why? He was an example. Think about it. What every businessman may become when his heart is, now listen, three things. When his heart is converted, when his heart has what? Is consecrated to God, and when his motives are pure. We're talking about success. Mm -hmm. Real. True success, mm -hmm. you see. That God's going to bless. I told a man who was going to be here today, going into a different business. And we encouraged both of them. Wife and I said, when you go into that business, make God your partner. Mm -hmm. If you make God your partner, you will succeed. Yeah. Amen. Did you get it? And not, that's not just paying what's due Him. 10% is already His. That's right. If you take that, you're a thief and a robber. Don't expect to get the kingdom. It ain't going to happen. And I know some of get mad because I put it on the line, but it, I can't help that. that. The Bible does say that. It says the thief and the robber is not going to enter the kingdom. Are you still with me? Yes. Yes. See, we need to not get mad. We need to talk to God about it if it upsets us so we can go through the forms, as it were, but if we don't do what God says we need to do, we're only a form. That's we don't have the power. That's why sometimes the church doesn't have power in it. Yes. It's because we're not doing what we know is right. right. There, you can't expect power when we're going against the Word of God, against the power. Mm -hmm. We've got to be working with the power of God. Yes. You say, well, I don't want to hear that. Well, you know, sometimes we need to hear these things. And to readjust our hearts and in our life. Not only the businessman, but in everybody here. So I told this man, well, to be, as it were, young again, and it were to start a business and to take God into partnership, how awesome that would be. It would be a business that you give to God, that you have God's blessing, the pureness of heart, because you wanted to do something so that you may give more to His cause. The more you give, thank you God, the more that comes in, the more I want to give. God says, good, that's the way it's supposed to be. It's not so you can get rich, it's not so you can have this or that. The main thing is God says, I want to bring it in so that you may, you heard the song, let's pass it on. Mm -hmm. It's more than just the music and more than just stories. It's pass on the blessings that God gives you. For the benefit of others, and I tell you, your cup won't be able to hold what God gives you if you're faithful in that commitment to Him. Convert it consecrated, and motives are right in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. And to us today, are, is it, it, are those things all right with us? Mm -hmm. So I think the key here to the businessmen and those who are in business, we have to have strict compliance, strict compliance with the requirements of heaven. That brings temporal as well as spiritual blessings. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. We line ourselves up with heaven, the requirements of heaven, it will bring what? Temporal, that means even things of this world. There's nothing wrong with having things of this world, is there? Most of us just don't know how to handle them. And God in His mercy that allows us to have them. We say we need them, and God says, no, you don't. That's the ruin. That'd be a ruination of you. Mm -hmm. He knows those who are willing to pass it on. That's what it's all about. Spiritual blessings, too. That tells me on the other side of the coin, they say, those that don't have God for their partner, their foundation is going to perish. God's principles, dear friend, God's principles are the only sure and steadfast thing in this world. Three things is what? They need to be, you need to be, businessmen, all of us converted, consecrated, and what? Motivated. Have pure motives. That's right. Have motives of our heart pure. True greatness consists in what? True godliness. And I might add this today too quickly before we get ready to wrap up. You think in terms of True, true greatness has nothing to do with the bloodline. I heard people say a bloodline. Mm -hmm. You ever hear that? Go, well, they're, you know, they're the, they're the son of this one and that one and so on and the bloodline. I mean, what is that? True greatness has nothing to do with form of, of, of fortune or, or fame, education, biggest house, biggest car, true success. No. No. I like a simple answer. I like the simple answer to this thing here about true greatness. <laughs> the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, it says the simple thing is, to, is simply to know Jesus Christ yes. and Him crucified. Yes. True success mm -hmm. in this life, mm -hmm. as heaven views it, mm -hmm. is to know Jesus Christ and Him crucified. See, it's easy to say, yes, that's right, but is it really sinking into our hearts and minds? What's involved into knowing Jesus Christ and Him crucified? If it hasn't changed you, you see, it hasn't done its work, you don't know Him. If it hasn't changed you, you don't know about Calvary. 
You don't know the one that was crucified if it hasn't changed your things that you used to love and now you hate and the things you hate you now love. If you still have the same old characteristics that you used to have before you met Jesus, you've not been converted. You don't know Him. Does that make sense? Yes. See, it's still simple one, two, three, and it will never change, but it's still the truth where we have to begin to get, our, judge ourselves, what the Bible said, have a close look at myself. I'm not trying to judge you. That's not my job. But the Bible will do that, right? The words out there, I'm saying is today, you say you know Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's a sign of a success in this life. Do you know Him and Him crucified? But yet your life's still the same? You don't know Him. You don't know Calvary. Calvary will change you. Yes. Amen. Calvary will, we hold Jesus Christ. That will change your heart and change your life and change the things that you're striving for in this life. Mastery, right? Striving for, for heaven, not the things of this life. True greatness is to know God, accept Him as my what? my Lord and my Savior, and follow wherever He leads. But I'm afraid that we've forgotten. It's so easy to say, yes, I know Him. And I know about Calvary. That's all anybody or preacher ever talks about. But when the Bible says converted, yeah. or true conversion, I would say then be, there could be a false conversion. How about you? If there's a true, there's always the counterfeit. Are you still with me? There's false conversion. So people might go through the form of godliness. We're baptized. We come into the church. But their heart and life has not changed. Something's wrong. Mm -hmm. right. See, something is wrong. That's not to be critical. It's simply so it'll wake us up and say, Ooh, what? I'm still kind of like I was 20 years ago. I wonder, Ooh. But I, I thought I was. See, I know about lukewarm condition. Yeah. I spent quite a few years of that in my, in my early time. And I said the biggest danger was that, Brother David, is I didn't know it. See, that, that's, that's the problem. It's not saying, well, let, let me, you didn't realize it. Why? Because mm, I was going through the form. I was doing the form. But the thought of it, think about my mind. I wouldn't think about working on the Sabbath because that's wrong. I stay with me. It's been two years in the service. That make you good. It's been two years in the service during the Vietnam conflict. I would not work on the Sabbath. I don't care what they said. I said no. And God honored that. And He worked it out every week. Every week God worked it out because I said no, I will not. I'm going through some forms. Jobs. Turn down job. Wouldn't work on Sabbath. Wouldn't do that because it, God said don't do it on the Sabbath. No work. But there's more to it than some of these things. Sure, it's incorporated in it. But it, it, did it really change your heart and change my life? Conversion came several years later. I was going through the forms, all right, and I stood for those forms. And you, you may be doing the same thing. But the old man was still there. Converted. And the Bible says that I need to. Remember Acts 3:19? It says to be repent and be what? Baptized. Yeah, repent you therefore and be converted. Talk about being baptized there. A superimposition. It says starts out when my life has been changed and when I commit success as God sees it and live a godly life, it's Kenny, you've got to repent. That means you have to turn away, yes. that you have to be different. Yes. That's what converted means. Remember, if the old man or woman is still there, they didn't die when you went in that watery grave. Oh, I know you've heard it over and over, but I'll tell you, dear friends, the old man or woman is still coming up. And sometimes you sense them coming back out of what? And you try to push them back down, kick them, stomp them a little bit, and they're supposed to stay down. But the old man comes back up. You're not happy with that. But there's victory, dear friends. Amen. Mm -hmm. God intended that when we accepted Jesus Christ and we changed our heart and life when I came up, that I would stay that way. I've said time and time again, there's, God never wants us to sin and repent and sin and repent and sin and repent. And sin. It's by the mercy of God that He's seen how weak and vacillating that we are, that we needed more help and more grace. And He said, I'll give you another opportunity because you're so weak. 
Most of us look, we're strong Christians. No, we're weak and we're yeah. vacillating. Yes. God said, I want to give you strength. When you come up here, that new man, new woman, that's the way you're going to stay in Him. And every day you're going to get stronger and stronger in Him. And every day you're going to behold Him like you've never beheld Him before. As you behold Him, you become changed into His image is what the Bible teaches. I need to be converted. If we're not, con you know, if we're not being converted on a daily basis, moment by moment, something's wrong. We're dying. I'm interested in the church. I'm interested in God's people. I'm interested in myself to be a successful Christian as heaven views it. Not as man views it. Huh. To be converted. Then I happen to read the passage of Scripture. Matthew 18, 3. It just simply says, Except you be converted. Is somebody with me? Except you become converted and of little, like little children, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. No. So it's not something here that's give and take, and, and, and I'm going to go year after year after year after doing the same old thing, never growing in grace, never growing in knowledge, never have, having the form of godliness, but my life's still the same. And nobody ever say anything to me. I'm going to blow up. Nobody ever do this. I'm going to. It's not right. That's right. That's not a Christian life. That is not Christ like. No, he never spoke one unkind word. You know, Lord help us all, right? He never discouraged anybody. He never talked about anybody. It wouldn't how, how low they sank, no matter how deep they were in sin. He went to them and He tried to elevate them, tried to raise them up yeah. out of that mess. Clean them off, brush them off, give them another start fresh in life. I'm thankful for that. I said here He went as deep as He could go when He went for me. I know some of you weren't that deep. I know what you're thinking. I was. Yeah, thank you. That's, that, that's, that has to be our, and that's not just talk, that we have to realize that we are a sinner, that we're bad. When Paul can say he was the chief of sinner, then I can say I'm worse than that. You follow what I'm talking about here? Well, I didn't kill like Paul did. I didn't persecute like you. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none good, no, not one. He's the one that's good. He's the one that lived a victorious life. I failed miserably, but by faith I accept that. He pulled me out of the dire mess that I was in, frailing around in this mud, this mess of sin, and pulled me up and cleaned me up and gave me the example of what I should be doing. Praise God. This is what we need in this life. He said, can you accept you are converted and become as a little child? In the Christian experience, many times we find this out. We find that, oh, so-and-so did something wrong. Well, I'm, just not, I'm not going to ever forgive them. Well, he can never forgive you if you can. That's right. Come as on. we forgive others, what the Bible says, the way He forgives us. And you realize what a hard heart that is? Yes. Oh, how difficult. You can't do it on your own. The Christ within. You have His heart and His mind. You can love the unlovely. You can love your enemies. We look at ourselves in my mind. I can't, I can't love somebody that does me wrong on my own. I almost said it makes me want to thrash him. I can't say that. That's a human flesh. That's the human speaking. But with the divine help of God, you see the Holy Spirit, you can love your, do good for them who despitefully use you. And what do I do as we close the day? There's more about, I'm going to talk about those three things I think is so, so important. Conversion, right? Being converted, consecrated, and the motives of the heart. If we don't get past those little ABC, one little simple things that we've always talked about, said amen, and praise God, but you know what? They've never had any bearing. They've never had any connection in your heart. they never connected with God with these things. They're just words to us, and they're good words, and we need to take them in deep. But no, it's more than that. They bring restoration and healing when I take them in. We need that. I need that daily. The Bible says in Psalms 19.7, it says the law of the Lord is... Somebody say perfect. I'll get excited. The law of the Lord is what? Perfect. Is perfect. And what does it do? Converting the, Converting the soul. That's why there's not very many conversions in the world today because people don't believe we don't want to keep the law. We don't have to worry about what God has said here. He's changeable. Everything is changed. We kind of do what we want to do. After all, look at the time that we're living in. The Bible said the law of the Lord is perfect, perfect and it converts the soul. It changes. Something happens. Yes. Yes. And you know what that means what talking about here? The law of the Lord is perfect. And it said it's an ongoing process. The word here in the original language said it's a converting and it's a continual converting of the soul. Yes. It didn't say, well, I, my soul has been converted. It's, all it's a continual growing. And to me, that would be what? You have justification, then you have what? Sanctification is a continual growing on, right? Go on. So the law of the Lord is perfect. Converting my soul. I'm continually doing what? Growing. Amen. I'm growing in Jesus Christ. It's converting my soul. And also one of the words says, I'm recovering. Yes. 
The law of the Lord is perfect. It's recovering my soul. Why? Because I need to be recovered. Why? Because I've sunk so deep and so low. I need somebody to save me. It's Jesus Christ. I need to be converted. I need to be recovered. And also, the law of the Lord is perfect. It talks about here, it's refreshing. Yes. The law of the Lord is refreshing. And it does restore. Yes. I need to be restored. How about you today by the grace of God? We're going to talk about next week the preparation of conversion. What takes place in that. And again, consecration. And the motives of the heart. And what we need to incorporate in. What needs to go and be put away. And to see how God is going to speak to your heart and my heart to make that change. Please, I beg you today. I'm talking to myself. and saying, Unless the Word of God is coming in and cutting Cutting the heart and cutting the mind. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it really means something to you. And you're coveting right now between you and God. That's all that's necessary. Lord, I want to be a success as heaven views it. That's all we're talking about, spiritual, right? I want, I want to be what you want me to be. I want to walk where you want me to, to, to walk. I want to be what you want me to be. That the Word of God coming in, what well, it's going to be cutting some things away out of my life. See, and if it's not, and again, if you're the same old, same old that we've been for 20 years, God help us. Isn't it time for a change? I think it is. Change in the life, a change in the character. See, I don't, I don't, I don't want to continue on the same way. I want every day when I get up, behold, all things are new. You know, that I had this, I had this freedom, I had this refreshing because of the grace of God. We can look back and say, you know, by His grace and strength, I can look at the law, oh, I can sleep at night. I haven't willfully done anything, you know, that comes back to haunt you, what it does in the world today, the conscience and, and you know, a lot of things going on in the world because they don't, they don't have a clear conscience. I want to be what God wants me to be. And I know there's some hereditary changes that need to take place and, you know, there's some, there's some cultivated tendencies, you know, in our life that the Holy Spirit will give us all complete victory over. No excuses. Please don't say, I came from the wrong side of town. I came from wrong, you know, on the wrong side of the tracks, you know, on the other side. That may be so, and you may have went through a nightmare, but the Bible promises all things become new. The old things are passed away. Don't know what all that all happened. No, no, as a Christian, they're passed away. In other words, God's given you the ability and the grace and the strength to overcome that issue. It's no longer an issue. It doesn't keep you down anymore. That's the enemy's plan. Mm -hmm. But you can get over that by the grace of God. Him Amen. who lives inside of you. Think what he had to get, get over as he lived in this life and walked this earth. And he can only do it through his Father's strength. Praise God. I want to be a success as heaven and today as we have prayer together. If that's your desire in your heart and your mind, I want you to pray with me as I kneel up here. And remember, if, if the message, if the Word of God doesn't do any good, if it's not, it doesn't find lodging in here, in your heart, Right? It's not doing you any good. It's just a head knowledge. So when the Word of God is spoken, take it personal from the Holy Spirit speaking. Not man up here, sinful, poor man. But just as the God speaking to you and to me, say, you know what? Things need to change. And I want them to change. And I want to be what God wants me to be, regardless of the cost. Because I tell you this, it costs to be a Christian. Yes. It will cost. But it's where it's well worth it. No matter what you go through in this life, I can say this, you know, when you see Jesus, you know, you're going to forget all that. No, it doesn't matter if you was martyred to all your kids, whatever, it doesn't matter. When once we see Jesus, we'll say it's worth it all. Amen. You hear that song, it's going to be worth it all one someday Amen. when we see Jesus. Amen. Be faithful to that calling. Be faithful to him that has called you because he's faithful. Let's pray about it now as you've made that commitment in your heart and in your life. Not, not just now. Not when you walk out the door and five minutes later you don't know what was, we talked about That's here. Right. That means it has found no lodging at all. But I'm going to pray that it finds lodging in your heart and you don't forget and I don't forget. Let's pray, shall we? Let's kneel as we pray. Merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for your precious word again. We pray, Lord, earnestly that the words that's been spoken here are your words, not my words, but your words will find a deep lodging in the heart and the minds of these, your children, today. We will not easily forget what we've heard and what we've been reminded of. It's nothing new, but what we've been reminded of that we want to be what God wants us to be. Put it in just simple language, we talk about success in this life or what God is like. Only those who are successful in the cause of Christ 
Well, heaven will be their home. Just a success. That means by the grace of God, we can't do anything to, to earn that. But Father, we pray a special way as those who have made that covenant right now that their lives will not be the same from this moment on. And every time that old man or woman comes crawling back up out of that old water, out of that old grave, mm -hmm. supposed to be dead, that we will spot it immediately and say, Oh Lord, I need some help. I need some grace. I need some strength. And I want victory. Don't want that old man to come up. I didn't like him when he was alive. Didn't like him. And I want to find peace and freedom in you today. Thank you for those decisions right now. We give you praise, give you honor, and give you glory. Thank you for the Holy Spirit now that will equip each individual here to move forward in grace and strength and be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Is my prayer today in Jesus' name.